Yeah, good morning, everyone. Welcome. So uh, a big thank you to uh, Dr. Josh Teichman for uh, <clears throat> not just uh, moderating and, uh, and running these rounds, but simply for volunteering. It's always a pleasure when he's uh, um, willing to give us rounds, and so we thank you very much. So he did his BSc at Queen's and uh, Doctor of Medicine from my alma mater from uh, University of Western Ontario, of course, Western University it's called now, and his residency at McMaster. And finally, um, he did his um, surgical fellowship in cornea at the University of Ottawa. Now he's won numerous awards and I still remember seeing him speak as a resident and he was very entertaining even back then speaking about tech and ophthalmology. Um, he also has the distinction of uh, getting 99th percentile on the OCAP. So something we're gonna hit him up to help our residents to also continue doing. Uh, he's now on faculty here, of course, and uh, he's on staff at Credit Valley Hospital and Trillium Health Partners. So he's a keen interest in research on the medical and surgical treatments of corneal disease. And he performs some of the most intricate corneal surgeries um, across Canada. So thank you, Josh, for joining us today. And we look forward to your, <coughs> your residence and your presentations. Thank you very much. And so um, we're going to start off with one of our great resident presentations. I'll just share my screen. Well, it's fine. Um, so I'm Alex Slavsky. I'm a fourth year resident here at the University of Toronto. And I'll be presenting the case of the round seed. Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Teichman for uh, allowing me the opportunity to present this case. And now that I know that he got 99th percentile, I'm definitely gonna hit him up on other questions as well. Uh, I also wanna thank Dr. Alshakar and Dr. Guerra that are here um, that provided me with the uh, information for this presentation and helped with creating this. So getting right into the case, uh, this was a 72 year old gentleman that was urgently referred for left eye epithelial defect that wasn't improving on moxifloxacin every hour. On the referral, they also noted multiple corneal infiltrates and as well as edema. And there was a question of reduced sensation in that eye. Um, the patient denied any contact lens wear or trauma or any foreign bodies recently. And he did not have a history of any cold sores or shingles in the past. He did have cataract extraction in both eyes about 10 years ago, that was uneventful. And he has a history of type two diabetes, high blood pressure and high cholesterol. And his physical exam, his visual acuity is 2030 in the right and count fingers in the left eye. The intraocular pressures were 18 in both eyes. On the sit lamp, the right eye was normal with a posterior chamber intraocular lens in the bag. Um, on the left eye though, there was a two plus conjunctival injection and there was an irregular epithelial defect measuring about two and a half millimeters in the long axis. There are also several small patchy infiltrates that you can appreciate in this photo here. You can see my cursor, is that right? Yeah. Uh, you can see here a little bit uh, removed from the main uh, epithelial defect. There's also some corneal edema that you can see obscuring the iris details, but there's no uh, frank anterior chamber reaction with no keratic precipitates or, or hypopion. Uh, similarly, there's no signs of detritus to suggest endophthalmitis. Uh, under cobalt blue light, you can see the epithelial defect a bit better, but you can also appreciate that there's a much larger area of abnormal epithelium surrounding it, um, indicating that uh, the, the, uh, the area affected is much larger than uh, on first appearance. So to quickly summarize, if you already forgot, it's a 72-year-old gentleman with a non-healing epithelial defect multiple corneal infiltrates and edema that is not responding to every hour topical moxifloxacin. So this leads us into our first poll, poll number four. Uh, so based on this presentation, what would your working diagnosis be? Do you think it's viral keratitis, a neurotrophic ulcer, bacterial keratitis, fungal keratitis, or some infectious keratitis, but without a known cause at this point? We'll give it a few seconds to uh, run through. Interesting to see how the answers are changing. Again, maybe another five seconds. We'll have a 50% response rate, so that's pretty good. Okay, I think that's pretty good. So um, as you can see, most people answered infectious keratitis NYD, which is exactly what I was hoping for. A lot of people answered fungal keratitis, I think suspecting what we're presenting. But at this point, we can't truly know what the, um, the cause is. Um, 
And in these types of presentations, we always want to distinguish between infectious keratitis and non-infectious uh, causes. Within infectious keratitis, there's a variety of, of uh, microorganisms that are be, could be causing it, including viral, bacterial, amoeboid, and fungal organisms. Uh, and within each category, there's a variety of different organisms that can be included. I listed some of the more common ones, but the lists are very, very long um, and varied. Uh, once we rule out infectious keratitis, we can consider other non-infectious causes like inflammatory um, causes like in staph marginal keratitis, neurotrophic ulcers, uh, recurrent traumas from contact lenses or foreign bodies, as well as toxicity from topical medications. But like I mentioned, we do want to rule out an infectious cause first. So for this patient, he underwent corneal scraping uh, for culture and stain and was started empirically on broad spectrum antibiotics, which is often our um, management for any large epithelial defects and ulcers. He was started on for fortified tobramycin and vancomycin every hour, as well as oral valacyclovir. At his next follow-up, uh, he was seen a, a few days later, about a week later, uh, and his physical exam really did not change. His visual acuity remained the same. The epithelial defect was unchanged and the infiltration and edema were still present. Uh, and importantly, his culture showed no growth. So this leads us to our next poll, uh, poll number five. But based on this, um, what would you do next? So, given that there is no growth on culture, would you continue the same treatment and see if time will take uh, its, its course and you'll see some improvement later? Would you add a fungal, uh, antifungal treatment, or would you want to have more definitive um, diagnosis by culturing again or taking a corneal biopsy? I'll give it a few more seconds to run as well. Okay. So we have a pretty close race here between. Um, going straight to biopsy, which I appreciate, or adding uh, an antifungal treatment. In this, uh, and, and all of these choices are reasonable depending on the context. Uh, in this specific case, a voriconazole was added, um, just trying to see if an antifungal coverage will help with the treatment. And is at, ne at his next follow-up, you could actually see that there was significant improvement. His visual acuity improved, the infiltrates started to fade, and the edema was improving. So at this point, uh, a presumed diagnosis of fungal keratitis was made. And you might find it a bit unsatisfying that uh, this is the, how we reach the diagnosis, just a response to treatment. But this case is meant to uh, demonstrate that diagnosing fungal keratitis can be quite difficult. Um, and I do want to make a, a certain point uh, first is that I'll be speaking mostly about filamentary fungal keratitis. Uh, fungal keratitis includes filamentary um, fungi like Fusarium and Aspergillus or yeasts like Candida. Uh, Yeast fungal keratitis is more similar to bacterial keratitis, so it's even more difficult to distinguish. Uh, but the major differentiating factors are in the filamentary fungal keratitis, and um, these are the more common ones as well. But in Canada, specifically, fungal keratitis is quite rare, as it is in other temperate climates. It's much more common in uh, tropical or subtropical climates, and specifically in developing countries where rural exposures are much more common. Um, for the exposure to the fungus. Uh, and fungus specifically is quite slow growing, which makes diagnosis difficult both on presentation, the, the, uh, all the patients present much later on, and on culturing since it takes longer to grow. And fungal keratitis tend to penetrate deeper into the cornea, so it makes it inaccessible for a superficial corneal scraping. Despite these difficulties, there are a few signs that we can use to our advantage to diagnose fungal keratitis. So in history, a slow rumbling course, uh, a prolonged course is often typical of fungal keratitis. And there are several risk factors that are associated with fungal keratitis, uh, specifically in developing countries, like I mentioned, in uh, rural environments and uh, a lot of agricultural work. Trauma, especially with vegetative matter, is considered to be a, a major uh, risk factor for introducing fungus into the cornea. In, developing country, in developed countries, contact lens wear is, is more common. This was really brought to everybody's attention when uh, the Renew contact lens solution back in 2004 or five uh, caused a worldwide um, spread of fusarium keratitis related to this uh, contact lens solution. Uh, other risk factors that can predispose patients to fungal infection include ocular surface disease and chronic steroid use, anything really that would 
compromise the uh, eye's immune, immune response to these uh, infections. In the slit lamp exam, a lot of features have been described in the past, uh, but there was a study by Dr. Thomas et al. in India and Ghana that actually did a multivariable analysis and they found that these three uh, features, feathery or irregular borders, a raised sloth, and pigmentation of the ulcer that's not yellow actually has a very strong positive predictive value in those populations in India and Africa and Ghana. Um, and they actually found a 92% positive predictive value when all three features was, were present. Uh, another classic sign that's often described as a satellite lesions, as you can see in our case with the infiltrates that are removed from the main ulcer. But despite all of these signs and uh, kind of clues on history, we do want to have a, a definitive microbiological diagnosis and that we do both with corneal scraping for staining and culture. <clears throat> There's a variety of stains that we can use. Uh, potassium hydroxide, gram and GEMSA stain are more, some of the more common ones, um, commonly used ones. The main advantage is that the turnaround time is quite fast, so you can get a, a positive result quite quickly, but you're not always able to have a specific species uh, from that diagnosis. Uh, and all of these sensitivities that are listed here, there's a, a wide variability of them, but they're all in relation to a culture positive result, uh, which is considered the gold standard. Despite being a gold standard, uh, culture negative rates, like in our patient, are very high. Uh, in large studies in Africa and Asia, they found up to 50% culture negative rate among uh, presumed infectious keratitis. <clears throat> There's a variety of reasons to that. Uh, some of them include the fact that oftentimes by the time they present for a culturing or a center that's capable of doing that, they've had some sort of antimicrobial treatment before that, so it can reduce the um, infectious load and, and reduce the likelihood of having positive culture. Uh, specifically with fungal infections, like I mentioned before, uh, they tend to penetrate deeper into the stroma, which makes them inaccessible for superficial corneal scraping. And, and there are plenty of reports showing that fungal keratitis are slow growing. So uh, fungi can take up to two weeks in culture to grow, uh, which is not clinically applicable since most labs will not keep the, the samples for that long. And you need to treat the patient in the interim. So uh, it is not as clinically useful. Because of these shortcomings of stains and cultures, uh, there are a few more novel techniques that have been proposed. Uh, in vivo confocal microscopy is a, <clears throat> a very sensitive exam. It's uh, actually non-invasive, just able to image a large organisms in the cornea in the patient. So it's a very attractive option. Um, you can see acanthamoeba or filamentary fungus. In this photo here, you can see the uh, hyphae in the, in the cornea. But the main challenge with these is that um, the operators need quite extensive training to be able to find these hyphae in the cornea. And the confocal microscope is quite expensive, so it's really uh, reserved only for highly specialized centers to have this technology. Uh, similarly, polymerase chain reaction amplification provides molecular diagnosis, which is very sensitive and very specific. They use the 16S ribosomal RNA, which is highly conserved sequence among organisms. So you can have a high certainty that uh, the organism is present. It's hard to distinguish between a non-pathogenic uh, uh, strains and pathogenic strains because it just detects anything that's in the sample. And again, it does require some level of expertise and resources, so it's not really available to most uh, locations. And the last uh, technology that's been used is anterior segment OCT. It doesn't really diagnose fungal keratitis, but does allow to characterize the infiltrate in terms of the width and the thickness of it. So they can use that for monitoring response to treatment, which also would be helpful for management of this. And the last uh, technique that's a bit more invasive uh, is a corneal biopsy, it allows you to get to deeper layers of the cornea, but Dr. Teichman will be speaking to that. I'll hand it over to Dr. Teichman. Sure, yeah, so <clears throat> thank you. Uh, great job. And. Um... You know, this is really just um, just quick to show that, you know, corneal biopsy, uh, as we didn't use here, but it, it's really uh, quite an easy technique and I think it's probably underutilized. And all it really takes is a dermatologic punch, like a two or three millimeter punch. And uh, after uh, partial thickness trepanation, probably try to aim for about a third the thickness of the corneal stroma. We just use a crescent blade and uh, take that little circle, uh, that little button, uh, off, cut it in two, send half to microbiology and half to pathology. So thanks. Okay, so going back to our 
our patient. He did not undergo a corneal biopsy uh, in this case, but we, he continued to be treated on, uh, on spec and on his response to treatment. He was seen for several weeks after that and continued to follow up. He was gradually improving, uh, but he started having a bit more of an inflammatory response. There was a keratic precipitate that was present and there's new neovascularization of the cornea. So at that point, uh, cyclosporin drops were added to his regimen. And you might wonder, why would you use cyclosporin for fungal keratitis? That's not typically uh, what we hear about the use of cyclosporin, but it's been proposed actually early in, in early 2000s for that. Uh, it was initially used for patients that had penetrating keratoplasty for a fungal keratitis. And uh, the investigators at that point wanted to have an anti-rejection medication that's also safe uh, in the case of fungal keratitis, so they're not risking the re a recurrence of the fungal keratitis. And in that case series that they showed in their follow-up, patients were um, did not show any signs of rejections and did not have a recurrence of the fungal keratitis. So apart from being safe, the added benefit is that cyclosporin in vitro, there's a, several studies that show it actually has antifungal effects against filamentary um, fungus. And in the case of uh, candida, it actually has a synergistic effect with fluconazole, improving its effect on uh, fungal in inhibition. So to conclude, uh, fungal keratitis can be quite difficult to diagnose, but uh, certain clues on history and um, on history and clinical appearance may be helpful. The culture does remain the gold standard, but uh, having negative cultures is not uncommon, as was our case. So if you have the resources, there's uh, several techniques that can be quite helpful in having a sensitive and specific tests. But in the absence of that, a response to treatment can often be used as a surrogate. And in patients that have uh, so an inflammatory response, um, using cyclosporin is a safe immune modulator to be used, but it actually may have some antifungal effects. So it should really be considered in fungal keratitis. Thank you. Great, great presentation. Thank you very much. And uh, I think in the interest of time, maybe we'll just have Ellie Cote uh, jump right in. And I'll, I've been trying to, there's only been a couple of questions on the chat. I'll be trying to answer them as we go. Myrna, don't worry, I'm answering yours right now. Perfect. All right. I'm sorry about the technical difficulties on my end earlier. I know that might have kind of messed with the flow a little bit. So I appreciate everyone's flexibility. I'll just share my presentation here. Okay. Um, so just um, to start, I'm Ellie. I'm one of the PGR3s at U of T. And just wanted to thank Dr. Teichman and the department for the opportunity to present and for providing the case. And to two of his fellows, Dr. Juvia and Dr. Al Shaker, who helped with kind of providing some of the details of the case and photos uh, for the case as well. Great. So jumping right in. Um, so we have a 61-year-old male who was referred urgently by an optometrist for right corneal ulcer. Uh, he does have a long-standing history of right neurotrophic keratitis, secondary to herpes zoster, as well as having right cataract surgery in the past. Otherwise, his medical history is unremarkable. And just to give a bit of context for what was going on. So he was followed by both an optometrist and an ophthalmologist for, keratid, for a flare of his keratoeuveitis for about the last month. He, would, he had been doing well recently. So actually his PRED port had been tapered down to once daily. Um, however, he did kind of have this ongoing epithelial defect. So he was given a BCL and placed on Vigamox as well. Now, five days before he made a, uh, his way to us, the patient did notice worsening vision in that eye, so returned to his optometrist. At this point, the Predfort was increased to QID and famcyclovir was added as well. Now, just kind of interestingly to point out, during the course of his uveitis flare, he did receive the Shingrix vaccine. Um, now, we don't think this was necessarily the cause of the issue because he was already in the midst of his flare, but we do just wonder if it's possible that this might have kind of contributed in some way to worsening the clinical picture. So on examination, his vision was quite poor at light perception. Um, pressure was normal. And then having a look at the slit lamp examination, um, 
So looking here, this is a slit lamp photo of the right eye. You can see the very obvious kind of dense central infiltrate um, with the surrounding epi defect as well. And it might be hard to fully appreciate here, but there is kind of about 70% thinning of the cornea with a plaque on the endothelium, as well as some fine to medium sized KP. Um, otherwise, the AC is deep and formed. There's no obvious hypopion. Um, the view to the fundus was a little bit hazy, but there was no obvious vitritis that could be seen there either. Um, and examination of the left eye was completely normal. So at this point, um, I'd just like to do a brief summary of the case just to kind of sum up where we're at so far. So essentially, we have a 61-year-old male uh, who has a history of neurotrophic keratitis secondary to herpes zoster, who's now coming in with a right corneal ulcer in the context of recent topical steroid use and, and placement of a BCL. And this ulcer is continuing to worsen despite the fact that his steroids were recently increased and um, the addition of famcyclovir to the case. Now, just to throw up kind of the first poll question for this case, I'm just curious at this point what people think the most likely diagnosis is. So is it worsening of his zoster? Is it a bacterial infection, fungal, acanthamoeba, or topical anesthetic abuse? So I can't see if that poll's finished there. Ah, perfect. Okay, great. So wow, that's a great split there. Perfect. And then kind of segueing into the next question of what would you do next at this point? So would you increase the Vigamox and stop or taper the Predport? Would you do cultures first and then increase the Vigamox and taper the Predport? Uh, would you do the same, but with topical fortified antibiotics? Or is this eye kind of a lost cause at this point and you'd refer for a nucleation or evisceration? Okay, perfect. Um, so yeah, in terms of the diet, what the most likely diagnosis was at that point, um, a bit of a split there, which was nice. So uh, we were thinking, you know, just based on probability, most likely here a bacterial keratitis. Um, of course, you still want to keep other infections like fungus on the differential, um, just given the history here. Um, however, we did not feel like this was necessarily a worsening of his zoster um, ulceration, just given the fact that he had recently been um, kind of increased on his famcyclovir and despite that continued to kind of worsen drastically. And as most people correctly identified, uh, the next step we're going to do is to do a corneal culture. So just a brief little bit on corneal culturing. So in terms of when we do a corneal on uh, culture indications typically include a uh, large ulcer. Ellie, there's several people saying they can't see your slides. I just want to check if that's an isolated thing. I can see them fine. Um, so the panelists seem to see them fine. Um, may, anyway, if there's other people in the audience who can't see them, um, just send a chat and we're, we don't know why. No worries. Okay, uh, and there's some instructions there. So I just minimized out of presenter view here. Can people see again? How is it now? Seems to be working now, I think. Okay, sounds good. Just let me know. All right. Um, so in terms of indications for corneal culture, 
And so often we suggest these in large corneal ulcers greater than two millimeters, or if there's kind of central or site threatening ulcers. If there's something on the history that suggests that there might be an atypical organism, um, or if they're not responding to the current therapy that you have them on. And um, you can see on the bottom left there, just a table of common kind of culture medias that we use just to highlight um, how it's important to use different medias um, to ensure that you kind of get coverage for bacteria, fungi, acanthamoeba, really make sure that when you're taking the sample, you um, are gonna be able to test for, for all of the organisms of interest. Okay, now just jumping back into the plan. So as most people correctly identified, in addition to uh, doing a corneal culture, we'll also wanna to start topical vancomycin and tobramycin in this case. Um, of course, we'll wanna remove the BCL. And given the fact that we're gonna be starting the fortified antibiotics, there's no need to continue on with the bigamox. Um, and then lastly, we also decided to add some oral doxycycline and oral vitamin C just for the kind of corneal healing properties that they carry and add to the situation. Now, once we do all this and the patient returns five days later, so at this point, his vision's hand motions. So, you know, when he, we first saw him, he was LP. So we're thinking maybe he's heading in the right direction. But then unfortunately you check his pressure and it's down to two. And when you have a look at the slit lamp, you're a bit horrified to see that he's, his cornea is incredibly thin with a decimetacil formation. And his AC is quite shallow and, and completely flat in some areas as well. Uh, so what's most likely happened here is that the patients had a perforation in the interim. And now, given the fact that the patient's kind of sitting here perforated with you in clinic, um, what would you do next? So I'll just um, ask the next poll, please. So at this point, would you suggest a therapeutic PKP? Uh, would you just go ahead and do a primary closure of the wound? Would you do some corneal gluing in BCL or just a BCL only? Okay, and that's great. So most people kind of correctly identify that in this case, we'll wanna do some corneal gluing. So you can see here on the left is a picture of our patient um, post gluing. And in terms of when we think about doing corneal gluing, so this is, I'd say co quite commonly used for acute corneal perforations, whether it's infectious, a sterile melt, um, and typically on the smaller side, so less than two millimeters or if there's severe corneal thinning and you're worried about kind of an impending perforation. In terms of the different types of glue that we have um, in ophthalmology, these are the two of the more common ones, uh, the cyanoacrylate adhesives and fibrin glue. Now cyanoacrylate adhesives are the one that you'll kind of see used most often in the case of corneal perforations. And they're nice for this reason because they do have some antimicrobial properties as well. Um, however, they do kind of solidify quite quickly, so that you just have to keep that in mind if you're performing a corneal gluing. And on the other hand, another glue you'll see quite commonly used is the fibrin glue. Now, this is not kind of traditionally used for corneal perforations. You'll see it more often used in trigium or any amniotic membranes. Um, but just wanted to highlight it there just, you know, to ensure you guys are aware that there are other glues available, although not necessarily for corneal perforations. So can you use fibrin for it, perf? I can't imagine. I don't believe, I think it's been researched, but I don't really think it's, it's done in practice. No, you wouldn't, you wouldn't. Okay, so I'll just hand it over to Dr. Teichman briefly now to just kind of talk about the technique of corneal gluing. Sure, thanks. So uh, just to go over it quickly in case you find yourself in the, uh, in the need to do this, uh, if you look at the left, that's the setup we use. So you want to obviously freeze the patient's eye. You want to use a speculum and you want to make sure they're not squeezing. If you have a thinning or a desmetacil, it's a lot easier than if you have an active leak. Glue does not stick to epithelium or to fluid, leaky fluid. So you have to have a really nice dry surface. 
Um, if you have a desk metaseal, be really careful with touching it with the wet cell because I've seen them perforate just from that. So uh, be extra careful there. Um, but really get the speculum in, have lots of wet cells open, ready to go. You can see that you have a, uh, a dermatology punch here. There's like a two to three millimeter punch and a plastic, a thin plastic drape. And if you look right at the bottom of the picture, you see lots of little circles. So what you do is you punch out a bunch of circles and then you take uh, some wooden Q-tips and you put a dab of any ointment. So here we've got some Toprodex it looks like. And then you dab the disc onto it. So you have, make a few like we've got shown here. Um, and then what you're gonna, the plan is to actually put a drop of glue onto the disc and use that disc right onto the area. By doing so, you actually keep that little disc uh, on the cornea, which is nice. It, it, it does uh, blunt some of the sharpness of glue. Glue is very sharp. Um, but uh, that's sort of the way that I generally suggest people do. Um, and you can see the glue, it's, it comes in this little container here next to the Toberdex. And uh, what we actually do is don't cut off the tip and use it. That's a massive glob. So I actually inject into it with a, with a, like an 18 gauge or 25 gauge and then put the, uh, withdraw it in a 1cc, put a 30 gauge on it and use the 30 gauge and don't use a whole drop. It's like a fraction of a drop. You wanna use uh, less is more. And, uh, and that's sort of the way we do it. And then you put a bandage contact lens on because it's very sharp after. But um, you can just dry it and apply the glue just directly from the tip of the 30 gauge. Uh, but you could, this is a little bit of a more elegant way to do it. So just uh, if you find yourself needing to glue, this is the way I recommend. Thanks. So I just have the little video here. I don't know. Play that briefly, just showing the glue. Great thing. And we should give uh, Sarah credit. These are, this, these are her pictures and video from her time with me. Josh, can you describe one more time? How do you get the glue from the little uh, ampule? You draw it with an eight, like you stick it. Yeah, sure. Like Sorry, I was, I was trying to be a little bit quick there. Um, so what I do is I take a 1cc syringe, which is uh, right in the middle of the picture here, and I put a 18 gauge needle, which is on the far right, on it. And I actually just go right through the plastic. And uh, so I actually, there's a little bulb at one end of it and that fine point, obviously normally you use the fine point if you were doing this on skin, but what I do is I force all of the fluid into the bulb and then I just jam right into the bulb, withdraw it and then switch the needle tip. That's how I do it. Thanks, sorry, I was probably not clear. Alrighty, so jumping back into the case now, um, so finally, at about a kind of 11 days follow-up or so, the culture did come back positive uh, for fungal elements, actually. So at this point, we decided to add voriconazole. And then when we saw the patient in follow-up again a few days later, um, we were able to get speciation, so both cryptococcus and alternaria alternata. And then finally, amphotericin B was added at this point as well. Um, and just wanted to highlight here how really in fungal cultures, especially the cultures can really take quite a while to come back. So it took almost two weeks for the first um, just kind of fungal elements to be seen and then eight days on top of that for the speciation. So um, if you're, you know, your case isn't responding how you think, it's just good to keep in the back of your mind that there might be something else going on. And then one month later, once everything was starting to improve, as, as Ellie kind of alluded to, we um, added topical cyclosporin to this case as well. Just to round off a very brief bit about fungal keratitis, I know Ellie touched on this, so I won't belabor it too much, but um, in Canada and the US especially, fungal keratitis is much less common than bacterial keratitis. And just important to keep a lookout for some risk factors. Um, in hindsight, many of which were present in our case. Um, so our patient was a contact lens wearer in terms of the BCL. Uh, he did use topical steroids and he did have a chronic keratitis from his herpes zoster. Um, okay, so that kind of rounds off my case. Uh, thanks so much. And I guess I'll hand it back over to Dr. Teichman for now. Great. If you just end your share, thank you. And I'm gonna, I'm just gonna jump right into mine. Um, great presentation, thank you very much. Um, and can you see my slides? Yeah. All right. So I just want to, uh, I'm gonna just jump in here, and uh, I want to thank everyone involved. These are my disclosures. 
don't worry about taking a picture of the QR code. It'll be presented at the end. Um, so my job is just to show one more case and then to highlight the key points that are really take home points from, uh, from the previous two excellent talks. So this is our third and final case. It's a 27 year old guy. He presented to the ER uh, with a two week history of pain, redness and decreased vision. Uh, he's currently be treated for HSV keratitis by another ophthalmologist. He has contact lens wear history. He's on Valtrex uh, one gram three times daily, as well as Lodomax four times a day, which they felt wasn't respond, uh, the ulcer wasn't responsive. So he was increased to every hour of Pred Forte. On exam, focusing on the left eye, his vision is reduced at 2100. There is a little bit of an injection with some follicles. The sensation is intact. There is ep uh, irregular epithelium, but no frank epithelial defect. There are two plus subepithelial infiltrates. There's diffuse haze and trace edema. Otherwise, AC is clear and uh, posterior segments with the normal limits. So I'm not gonna do full uh, polls just in the interest of time, but I'm just gonna get you to ask yourself, what is your presumed diagnosis at this time? Is this HSV keratitis as was previously thought? Is this a bacterial keratitis that was missed? Is this fungal keratitis that is missed? Is this a amoebic keratitis or is this anesthetic abuse because the guy is in a lot of pain? So now that you've thought about that for a second, let's continue the case. So any patient that comes to you saying they have herpes and they wear contacts is a canth amoeba until proven otherwise, especially if you're a cornea specialist. So there is, that is your presumptive, presumptive diagnosis 10 times out of 10. And so the first thing you have to do here is, is culture like we've done in every case so far. Uh, stop the contact lens wear, stop the Pred Forte, continue the oral Valtrex because it's probably one of the safest drugs we have. Start him on Vigamox because he's not, uh, he has no antibacterial uh, coverage. And I was, I was convinced enough that this was acanthamoeba that I started PHMB and chlorhexidine, but I started them at every two hours instead of every hour because I still didn't have culture positivity. Uh, a couple days later, we get the gram stain back, which is uh, no organisms, but lots of pus. We get our uh, culture back, which is negative for growth. And we get our herpes PCR back, which is negative for HSV 1, 2, and VZV. And then a couple of days later, we get our PCR back for acanthamoeba, which is positive, which is what we expected to begin with. So on March 31st, which is about a week later, he's slowly feeling better. The injection is reduced. We get him to continue the chlorhexidine and the PHMB. Uh, we stop his Vigamox. Another two weeks later, he's stable. We decided it's safe to decrease his PHMB. And uh, two weeks after that, so about a month after presentation, he comes in and he's saying he feels slightly worse. He's got more papillae and he's got an X-shaped epithelial defect. The infiltrates themselves are fading. They're becoming scarred, but he has a new epithelial defect, which he never had before. And it's given this irregular shape. So now I have to ask you guys, what's happening now? So. One, this was HSV all along. I was wrong. Um, you know, first off, just was right, and I shouldn't be giving this talk. Um, two, this is a bacterial super infection, right? He's got a sick eye. Three, it's fungal super infection. He's got a sick eye. Um, four, I tapered his acanthamoeba medication too soon, and now he's worsening, and I should have known better. And five, this is toxicity. So I can, uh, I'd like you to think about that for a couple seconds. And, uh, you know, I don't think there's really a wrong answer, but. This was felt to be toxic. Uh, the patient uh, thought that the PHMB burned a lot more than the chlorhexidine. And this is contrary to the literature and popular belief, um, but we decided to go with him and we stopped the PH, uh, we kept him on the PHMB and we stopped his chlorhexidine and we added non-preserved ointment four times a day and, uh, and at bedtime. So now fast forward another few weeks uh, he's been seen a couple times. His toxicity improved. The X-shaped epithelial defect improved. In the interim, he developed another uh, epithelial defect, which also healed. So he's healed all his defects. Um, he has significant scarring. There's lipid. There's neovascularization. This is all from chronicity. This is unfortunately a reality of any chronic corneal condition. Um, and he's got, you know, he's still got a, quite a bit of inflammation. Like the eye looks hot. And so we talked about it and we decided we'd add Pred Forte twice a day only, and he was only going to do six doses prior to his next visit. So when he comes in, I'll have seen him after just about three days, and we can say if he's getting worse, we stop it immediately, and if he's getting better, we can continue it. 
And he comes back and he's much better. And in fact, the eye is white and quiet. It's the best it's ever looked. The epithelium is beautiful. And even the scarring and lipid and neovascularization is improving. So we're all pretty happy here. And uh, we think we've pretty much finished with this case. Um, he then shows up a month later, uh, presenting urgently saying, uh, you know, I think things are really wrong. Can you see me? And so he's got a new recurrent epithelial defect and there's haze at the base. It looks really toxic, um, more so than infectious. Um, but you know, this is a this is a sick eye, so we decide to culture. And to be safe, we take him off of the prednisone. We add Vigamox as there's an epithelial defect. We give him some siloxin, and we keep him on PHMB, of course. Now, I want to talk about PHMB for a second. Um, PHMB is great, as you know. It's Baquisil. It's basically pool cleaner, and uh, it does not really have much effect against herpes virus. Um, so not really effective at the 0.02%. At high concentrations, it is quite, uh, it can be effective against HSV, but not at the low doses that we use for acanthamoeba. Now, it's antimicrobial, uh, and we know this because this is why we put it in pools. So uh, it's, it's got good coverage over uh, gram-positive, gram-negative bacteria, and even some fungus. So it's effective for many bacteria. And also, it's uh, effective against aspergillus, and it's effect, uh, effective against fusarium. So it covers both yeasts and molds. So it's, it's actually effective for many fungi. So it's, it's a pretty good killer of, of a lot of things. So, you know, what's going on now? So the first question is just, and how many times am I going to miss that this is, is herpes? And so that, that's question number one. Question two is, does he have a bacterial superinfection? Although we've said that PHMB does not treat HSV well, so number one could be right. It does treat bacteria, so that's pretty rare. It does treat fungus, so that would be pretty rare. Um, again, his acanthamoeba is worsening, and I just continue to miss it. Or he's got worsening toxicity or allergy. He's not compliant. Any, anything I can do to really blame him, actually, would be uh, ideal here. And uh, so... We recultured and uh, again, no growth. Herpes is still not detected and acanthamoeba is no longer detected. So actually I killed that off. So that's a half win, I guess. And, um, and he worsens incredibly rapidly and he develops this uh, infiltrate, which is feathery and it has thinning. And you know the reason he worsens so rapidly is because we stopped his steroids, which was hiding this, right? So, Immediately, this was presumed fungal superinfection, and we started voriconazole every hour, oral voriconazole, uh, doxycycline, and vitamin C because he has some thinning. And uh, in the next two months, he has gradual improvement and then complete resolution. And his last visit, which is now like nine months after this all started, his acanthamoeba keratitis is completely quiet on chlorhexidine. At some point, we did switch him from PHMB to chlorhexidine again. Um, he has no toxicity. His secondary fungal keratitis has completely resolved. Uh, but as you can see from this crappy picture, he actually emailed this to us um, from his iPhone. He has dense scarring, uh, NV, lipid, and his plan is to get a, a DOLC or a PK once uh, he's quiet. Usually we, we wait six to 12 months, given the fact that these cysts can remain there dormant, and uh, we're not going to do him any favors putting him on steroids. So, now all I really wanna do is highlight the points that were already made by the, by the uh, residents. And so if you look at this, it's daunting, so I'm gonna make it easy. Really think of fungi, yes, we talk about yeast and filaments, but I want you to think of it three ways. I want you to think about yeasts, filamentous fungi that are hyaline, and those are clear, and filamentous that are demaciaceous, and those are pigmented. Uh, yeasts are candida, and they also, we always used to say candida and candida. So we're a temperate climate, you get candida. Now, we've just shown from the three cases that's not really true. And actually, we've shown from three cases, two of which were culture negative. So it just goes to show how difficult these are to culture. Um, but Candida and Cryptococcus uh, are the yeast we're generally worried about. And, and one of the patients had Cryptococcus. Um, filamentous, that's the Aspergillus, Fusarium, Pyselomyces. Uh, Fusarium is a real bad player. Uh, none of these are good players, but Fusarium is a devastating corneal infection. Um, and then the filamentous that are demaciaceous, these are darker pigmented. Those are alternaria. So our, our one patient actually had alternaria and cryptococcus, so a yeast. Okay, um, and then curvilaria is the other one that's more uh, the, that we see more common. That we see more. Those are sort of the main fungi that we see. And if you can kind of keep that uh, straight, that's 
pretty much all you need to know about fungus. Um, to hit hard on the presentation, we talked about how it can look feathery or thick. And if you look here, there's multifocal lesions and there's definitely feathery edges. Um, but this is a classic, uh, believe it or not, Neisseria infection. So, so thick and feathery might help. Um, satellite lesions are something that we always talk about and uh, all of our cases have had them. And if you look here, when you have a, quite a nasty ulcer here, and then a bunch of lesions, but these are kind of by the margin, right? So, so this is staph. Um, and if you look here, you have a big nasty lesion and some satellites beside it, uh, feathery borders. Um, this is a very, thankfully, way less common now, uh, thanks to fluoroquinolones, but this is a very common nasty infection after LASIK before, and this is mycobacterium. And lastly, here we've got a real soupy ulcer with a, a bunch of satellite lesions as well. And this sort of super soupy grossness is, is pretty classic for strep. So satellite lesions are also not super helpful. Endothelial plaques. So this is a case you see a hypopion and an endothelial plaque. You have thinning. Uh, the stroma is not too bad though. And so, uh, you know, no surprise here, this is HSV. So I really want to tell you that pigment is the best indicator that this is going to be fungus. So if you see pigment, this is fungus until proven otherwise. So this is a great example of pigment in the lesion, pigment in the test tube, and pigment on the actual fungi. So if you see pigment, it's fungus until proven otherwise. For our medications, I'm going to simplify this. Three classes, polyenes, azoles, and echinocandins. Now, the azoles have two groups, the amidazoles and, uh, and the triazoles. But honestly, just think of them as one group. And in ophthalmology, I want to actually just think of just a few drugs, because we only really use a few drugs. So the second row is if, if you're really you know like an, an antimicrobial nerd. But I want to go to the third row and just really hit home the key points. Amphotericin is great for candida, and it's OK for Aspergillus and Fusarium. All right, it can be compounded. Natamycin is the only commercial, uh, commercially available antifungal in North America. It is available in the US. It's made by Alcon. It is not available in Canada. Your option is to ask for special access through the US or just get it compounded by a pharmacy like Habers. I would strongly su suggest the latter, given how much easier it is and how much quicker you'll get it. Um, Natamycin is a bit better for fusarium and aspergillus as opposed to candida. So really, here we're really using amphotericin. Um, uh, natamycin, I'm going to get to in a second. Boriconazole, now this is what you've seen most of our patients treated with. Um, it can, it's, it's topical and oral, um, and it's actually pretty good for all except non-Solani fusarium. And fusarium Solani is a real bad layer, like it's the worst. Um, now you remember fluconazole, ketoconazole, itraconazole, all those other conazoles, azoles, um, they're pretty much all oral or they're topical used for like dermatology or other things. They're not really used in, um, in ophthalmology. So you can skip them. Posa, conical, uh, posa has been used for rescue therapy. Just forget about it. So really, really you're thinking Ampho, Nata, Vori. And then I want to introduce you to Caspo. So a lot of- Gosh, Before you carry on the Vorconazole, how, like, is that also need to be compounded or how do you get that? Yeah, vor all of them, all of these are compounded. Great question. All of them are compounded. All of them are available at Habers. Um, you may, your, if your hospital has a good compounding pharmacy, they might be able to do it. If they compound at all, you can get, ask Habers to send them the recipe. Um, so that's another way to do it if you're at, a, say, you're an, you're an inpatient at one of the other hospitals. So um, all of these are available, though. And I know for a fact Habers can make all of these. So sometimes you can ask them to send the recipe to, to a, a hospital or something like that. So I'm going to tell you why we use these now. So, you know, where's the evidence? So there's the MUT trial, mycotic ulcer treatment trial. And uh, just to tell you, this, is, this, this trial is probably the best evidence we have in fungal ulcers. And it is, it is hotly debated. So I want to kind of go over some of this debate. They compared an RCT. It was designed and analyzed at UCSF, the Proctor Foundation. But it was completely performed in India. And that's one of the big criticisms, because obviously, uh, the thing is, California has about a 5% ulcer rate that's positive for fungal. And India, 50% of their ulcers are fungal. So to get five, you know, to get 300 people, which is what they recruited in like two years, that's that's an insane number. So so um, designed and analyzed, uh, you know, in California, but made in India, it's kind of like Apple computers, if you will. So 
if you look here, they compared uh, RCD of NADA versus VORI topical because many people, because there was a previous survey that went out that a lot of cornea specialists figured that VORI was better because um, it was newer and uh, it made more sense. So they wanted to see if it was actually better. And the result, they actually stopped this trial early because natamycin was better. So contrary to what you would think, natamycin showed better. Now, when they reanalyzed the data, 50% of the ulcers were fusarium. And VORI is actually found to be worse in fusarium. So if you take out the fusarium ulcers, VORI and NADA are identical. So the take home point to this is NADA and VORI are identical unless you have fusarium, in which case natamycin is probably better. That's the real take home. And contrary to what you would think, once they've now stopped the study and they give everyone natamycin and they do another RCT comparing oral uh, nothing versus oral VORI, they actually found that adding oral VORI to topical natamycin somehow improved fusarium outcomes, which doesn't really make sense based on what they said. However, I guess you are just giving two drugs, so that might be why. Um, now, this has been reanalyzed. Um, they actually, they actually reanalyzed it and said that, uh, you know, maybe, uh, you know, we got to look at the secondary analysis. We got to look for low vision outcomes. We have to look at what if they're positive or negative culture. We have to look at uh, perforations and need for therapeutic PK. We have to look at uh, pretreatment. Um, you know, we have to look at vision quality of life. Uh, we have to look at other things. And uh, let's do a uh, regression discontinuity, uh, discontinuity analysis, which is another one. And if, you know, the statisticians are wondering if they did a Bayesian analysis, yes, they did that too. So literally this data has been reanalyzed. Like this is, if you were part of the study, you got like 30 papers out of it. So there's a lot to be said, but, but it, it can be summarized pretty simple. Use natamycin or voriconazole unless it's, unless it's fusarium, in which case use natamycin. And you can add vori if you want or not orally, but it probably doesn't make a difference. And now the newest player is the Caspo. So again, this is at Habers. And the reason I'm actually, I'm not plugging Habers, I'm not a consultant for them or anything like that. But for most of the people on this call, you're probably in the community and that's probably the only place you're gonna get any of this stuff. Um, you know, if patients ask, it's about $250 for about 200 drops. It's about a dollar drop. So they probably need about two bottles. It's expensive, but it's, it's gonna try to save their eye. Uh, I should mention that the price is about the same for Bori. Um, and so there's a bunch of studies out here. Elmer Tu's up there, as you know, he is probably the, the world expert in infectious keratitis. Um, and so I have to say, if I have a case of, uh, you know, tricky uh, fungal keratitis, this is probably gonna be the next drug I use. And uh, just to hit home on, we, we heard about cyclosporin. Um, so both cyclosporin and tacrolimus are anti-inflammatories, anti we know that. Um, but they actually both have intrinsic antifungal properties. So in two of the three cases we presented, we used them as an adjunct to reduce the inflammation because you can't use steroids. So one of our patients had, um, they had an, act, an active keratouveitis when they got sent to us from HSV, HZV and were secondarily infected. So here they cannot go on steroids. So by using the, uh, the, the cyclosporin, you can at least help with some of that inflammation and it's actually gonna probably help or at least do nothing to the fungal infection. So uh, just a thought, these, this is really good to calm down any, any fungal inflammation. And then lastly, just talking about surgery, uh, Myrna Lichter asked a great question about cross-linking in the chat. The, the truth is the results are very conflicting. There are small studies that show that it might help, but then one of the studies that, that, that um, showed a 50% perforation rate in the cross-linking group compared to zero in the non-cross-linking group. So that in and of itself makes cross-linking very scary in these ulcers to me. Um, they've used PDT, try, um, that's, that's tried. But um, you know, the, the truth is in the MUT2 study, 50% of people went on to either perforation or needing a therapeutic penetrating keratoplasty. So unfortunately, um, this is a medical disease until it isn't, in which case it's a, it's a surgical disease. And, uh, you know, fusarium salami, like I mentioned, uh, is, is one of the bad players that almost always ends up going towards uh, surgical management. You know, for the fellows, you always want to measure at least about a millimeter to a millimeter and a half bigger than the infected area. And then uh, and always use interrupted sutures because you might have to remove them quickly. Uh, <clears throat> you know, you might want to irrigate the anterior chamber with uh, BSS or even um, an antifungal. There was, you know, here there's an, again, the same group did a, a RCT doing intrastromal voriconazole and actually found no benefit. So although people love to inject intrastromally, um, the best study showed actually no benefit to it. 
and um, and uh, if there's obvious infection, uh, so if there's a, an IOL or even a lens or the iris is infected, you need to remove that because you will not cure this otherwise. Um, so this is often what they look like immediately after surgery. These are huge graphs. This one's like 12, this is like limbus to limbus. There's nothing left. And, um, and, and unfortunately they still don't do very well. You need to keep them on antifungals. You have to avoid steroids for at least two weeks, which means a lot of these are gonna just fail. The point is you fail it, you save the eye, and you do an optical graft later. Um, in the interim, we hit them hard with uh, cyclosporin or tacrolimus, and we use high-dose oral NSAIDs to try our best to keep this to, to survive. But as I mentioned, often they fail, and then later we come back to do whatever we can to salvage vision. So sort of to summarize, although these are a minority of infections, um, they're really bad. Uh, they, they appear to be worsening, and there's a UBC multicenter study that we're uh, part of uh, showing that it's, you know, they're trying to say that they, that this is increasing and it, and it almost certainly is. Um, there, you know, there's a few types that you got to think about. Uh, although we used to say candida and candida, uh, this is sort of changing as well, probably, possibly from weather changes. Um, we know the risk factors. Look for pigment. That's probably your best for sure sign. Um, everything else, you know, just keep a high index of suspicion. Uh, culture, 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 even though these are difficult to actually get something, at least you've tried. And they have a protracted medical and surgical course. Um, so these are, these are, you know, these are really bad players. Anyways, thank you very much. And uh, thank you to, uh, to Sarah and, and Larissa for helping with uh, collecting some of this stuff. And thanks to Ellie and Ellie for the, uh, for great presentations. So all in my share. Well, thank you, Josh and uh, Ellie and Ellie. Those rounds were awesome. You guys did a great job. Always, always um, great presentations from Dr. Tykin. So thank you. Thank you. Do we have uh, any burning questions? Any, there... any final questions? Mm -hmm. And Josh, when you see that pigment, does that mean it's therefore pigmented fungi? It, it does, exactly. Yeah. So the only time that pigment is not, well, okay, so this is not, you know, you can't make this a rule, but if there's pigment, it is fungus, it is pigmented fungus. Um, the only other time you're gonna really see pigment is if they've had a perforation and that's iris pigment. Other than that, you have to think about this. And then there's one other thing that can be confused is if they have deep stromal vessels, those can bleed in herpes and in other things. And if they bleed, it can look you know, it'll start, it's like a bruise basically, and it can look purple and blue and brown. So that can, that can be confused, but for the most part, yeah, pigment is, is pigmented fungi. Once again, thank you all. I think uh, <clears throat> no, thank you. demystified some of the mystery of these ulcers and uh, uh, the pearls on what we can do, uh, you know, for in the general ophthalmologist when we're trying to deal with these things until we, uh, we send them your way. Please don't. No, I'm kidding. Before we, before we end this, Josh, there's one question from Dr. Epstein in the chat. How long does it take the cornea to recover from the biopsy that you showed? Oh, great question. Um, it, it's pretty quick. It depends on, if you think about it, if you do it nicely, you have um, a two or three millimeter epithelial defect. I normally use a two millimeter biopsy punch. If you look, you think you want to use a three, and then when you put it on the cornea, you realize it looks like a whole quarter of the cornea is being taken off. So, um, it is a two, it's a two millimeter uh, circumferential, uh, sorry, two millimeter diameter uh, lesion. So if you think it, it epithelializes in about the same amount of time that epithelial defect would from that size. Um, so a day or two, um, I mean, these are often sick eyes, so it could be a bit longer, but even in the sickest I've seen it, it's usually like a day or two, very quick, very quickly, but it'll be thin. Um, and then so with time, the epithelium will plump up and usually it'll fill most of the defect. There may be a, a chronic low level divot, but not normally. Um, and, and you really want to do about a third of the thickness of the cornea. Like we're not looking for 80% here. We, you know, it's just, it's just the top. If you have a really, uh, a really deep ulcer um, that is not superficial, then uh, I would actually not, obviously you can't culture it or biopsy it. Um, I would recommend there's a really nice technique where you use um, you get a, like a 5-0 braided silk, some sort, sort of really uh, suture that's got lots of nooks and crannies, and you actually pass the suture right through the, the deep ulcer, and then kind of as you're pulling it out, you kind of touch on it, you like really try to get it to stick, 
and then take the whole suture, cut it into pieces. Some of it goes into blood and chocolate and thigh and, and, and send it like that. And that can uh, be a great way to bring get bugs from the deep cornea. All right, thank you, Josh. Oh, we'll end this off with one more question. So Juliet Otiti is one of our colleagues from a uh, equatorial country. So I'm sure she sees a lot more fungal keratitis than most of us do, maybe not Josh. Um, and her question is thoughts on intrastromal injections for fungal right. keratitis. Yeah, so, so here's, so my thought is this, I know a lot of people like to use them, but the best study we have, which is again, the, the Proctor group doing a study out of India, was an RCT evaluating uh, intrastromal voriconazole plus treatment versus uh, no interest or the same treatment without the intrastromal injections. And they actually found that the voriconazole did not help. So as far as the literature goes, uh, intrastromal voriconazole does not help. Now, um, it makes sense that it would help a little. There's no reason that depositing, we know that most of the antifungals have, um, some of the antifungals don't have great penetration, especially through intact epithelium. Um, so you'd think surrounding this with a high dose of, um, of drug should be beneficial, but at least the studies haven't really shown that. Um, I, I, for that reason, I don't normally do it. It's also just a huge pain in the butt to do that in a prep in, to do that in a clinic outside of a hospital in Ontario is a nightmare. Um, the patient has to go and get the drug every day from the pharmacy, bring it to you. You have to inject it and you do this time and time again. It's, it's and it's very expensive. Um, so I actually don't use it, but, um, you know, like I said, the, the best evidence says it's probably not helpful. Some people think it might be it as it may. I'll leave it to you. Thank you. For a great question. All right. Thank you, Josh. Thank you. Thanks, guys. So once again, uh, we'll end it there. Uh, fantastic talks uh, from all three of you. Thank you very much for uh, <clears throat> taking us through how to manage these things. Have a good day, everybody. All right, happy Valentine's and family day, guys. See you next week. You too. Take care, guys.